I was having a discussion with some of my uh, in-laws at uh, dinner table after Thanksgiving, uh, our Thanksgiving meal, and we started talking about cilantro. Uh, I love the taste of cilantro, also known as coriander, but apparently uh, there's some percentage of the population, 10%, uh, 15%, who feel that cilantro tastes awful, and many describe a soapy taste to cilantro and feel it's disgusting. I'm not sure which camp you fit into. And so I wanted to talk about that. Clearly there's a chemical basis to that if people are having these uh, differing opinions about the flavor of cilantro. Uh, <clears throat> I found an, a news article that had started to unravel. I think it, uh, some of the, mo the important work started to come out around 2005. And, and then there was this paper that was published by the people at the genetics company, the screening company 23andMe, who published a paper where they analyzed uh, the genes of thousands of volunteers. Um, and what they found is they were able to trace bad taste, people who felt that the taste of cilantro was bad or soapy, to a very particular single nucleotide polymorphism in, uh, in a gene, OR6A2. Those are the olfactory receptor genes. Um, you got hundreds, several hundred of these in the human proteome, human genome, that code for odorant receptors that line the nasal epithelium. And so clearly there's some very particular uh, set of, of SNPs or, or in particular mutations in those proteins that lead uh, <clears throat> cilantro to have a soapy taste. Here's a fanciful picture with somebody eating a open-faced soap sandwich with cilantro on there. I can't imagine how I would feel if cilantro tasted soapy to me. Let's take a look at the molecules that are involved in this perception of soapy flavor by some people with cilantro or coriander. So if you take the essential oil of cilantro or coriander and you look at the composition of that essential oil, if you extract that out into a steam distillation, what you would find is a lot of aldehydes in there that play an important role in the composition of that essential oil. So aldehydes like decanal, tetradecanal, 18% of the composition of that essential oil. But then you also find some unsaturated enals uh, in there. So here's, uh, I think, a 10-carbon enal that has the double bond conjugated to the aldehyde. And then there's a 12-carbon enal, dodecanal, or sorry, dodecenal, uh, that has a double bond conjugated. And it's these two molecules that have the double bonds, these alpha-beta unsaturated uh, aldehydes, these enals, that are correlated with the soapy flavor. This was uh, worked out by a, a, a group previously that's, that studies the chemistry of small molecules. So there's something about these molecules here that have the double bond where that interact with some people's odorant receptor. I forgot the, the odorant receptor number. Um, that causes that intense soapy flavor. This has a very strong, powerful binding effect. Um, you know, when I think about what is soap, why, what, if you feel like something tastes soapy, what is it soap binds to in your receptors? And again, this is an odorant receptor. A lot of, of your perception of taste has to do with uh, interactions with the odorant receptors in the nasal epithelium, not just the human taste receptors that you find mainly localized in the tongue. I'm showing you two structures of soap down below here. So bar soap, solid soaps, are made by uh, saponification of fatty acids. And you get these long chains, 14 carbons, 16 carbons, 18 carbons. And in particular, the saturated ones are the ones that are solid. And if you make, if you do a hydrolysis of lipids or fats using sodium hydroxide, you get the sodium salts of these long chain carboxylates. And that's bar soap, like ivory soap that you might wash with. Liquid soaps, like shampoo, are synthetic. They're sulfate esters. We haven't talked about making sulfate esters in this class, but you can imagine that if you replaced the, the carboxylate with a sulfate group, uh, just by taking some sort of an alcohol and making a sulfate ester out of that, that it might have very similar properties for disrupting membranes of bacteria. And that's liquid soaps, that's shampoo. Pretty much every shampoo has this compound, sodium laureth sulfate. If you wanna go make your own company, just go buy some sodium laureth sulfate, mix it with water, add some, some cool smells in there, and you'll have your own fancy so, uh, shampoo. 
you know, I'm going to state what's kind of obvious here that nobody in this field is saying. It's probable that soap molecules of either of these types are binding in the receptor pocket. These are seven transmembrane domain G protein coupled receptors. It's a common class you would have heard about in your bio classes. Um, probably there's an ammonium ion or, an, or a guanidinium ion in, that at, in the binding site of those uh, receptors that, that forms, you know, that seems to be selective for soap like molecules. That's probable. So it wouldn't be surprising to me if the amine in that binding pocket for some, for some individuals forms an iminium ion or an imine with the aldehyde. It would be very hard to stop that from happening. That's not unusual. If you've learned about uh, rhodopsin and, um, and, um, and your ability to see light, that's due to 7TM receptors uh, that form an imine or a shift base with retinal, another aldehyde. So probably, you know, again, who knows? Somebody would have to study that. It's probably forming a covalent bond for some individuals um, in the same, uh, in that same odorant receptor binding pocket. All right, <clears throat> cilantro. I love the flavor, so I clearly don't have that SNP, <laughs> that single nucleotide polymorphism, thank goodness. But I can't imagine how awful that would taste if I did have that. We are getting so close to finishing our lectures for this, uh, for this quarter, our lecture material. Uh, I hope you were able to study or find the means to study over this, uh, this holiday weekend that we just had celebrating Thanksgiving. Uh, but really, you've got one week left. Monday, a week from now, we're going to be taking our final exam in this class. It's going to be a cumulative final exam covering all the material for the class. That's why it's worth a little bit more. And we also, this Friday, have exam three. And so that's going to cover the enolate chapters, chapters 21 and 22, and then this final amines chapter. So let's go ahead and finish up our, our last part on this amines chapter where I introduced you to the interaction of nitrous acid with amine groups. Nitrous acid, totally different from nitric acid, right? It's, it's nothing at all like nitric acid has three oxygens. Nitrous acid has only two oxygens and is not stable. You can't buy it from anywhere. You've never bought a bottle of, or used a store-bought bottle of nitrous acid. You make that in the lab by mixing sodium nitrite, this white powder with hydrochloric acid, and that makes small amounts of unstable nitrous acid, which is in equilibrium with this nitrosonium ion. NO plus. And that's reactive. Nitrosonium ions react with amines. And so what I talked about on, on, on um, Wednesday before we left was the reaction of secondary amines with nitrous acid. When you react secondary amines with nitrous acid, you get these N-nitroso compounds. And I told you that if one of these R groups is a methyl group, or both of them, <laughs> That's going to cause cancer. Right? There's not that many molecules that scare me, but N-methyl nitrosoamines scare the living daylights out of me. I would never want to expose myself to that. Um, but what we're going to talk about now is what happens in the unusual situation, where, or not so unusual, where one of these R's is an H group. Actually, uh, yeah, one of the R's is an H group. Then we're going to see interesting chemistry. Right, that's when we're going to start to see interesting stuff happen. So let's go ahead and talk about when one of the R's is an H group and the other R is an aromatic ring, because that's when we've got interesting chemistry um, going on. So what we're going to talk about now is what happens if we take an aniline and we mix that aniline with this mixture of sodium nitrite and HCl. Then we're going to make this amazing functional group called a diazonium group. Wow, look at that. You know, when I think about the most stable, unreactive molecule, I think nitrogen gas, N2. N triple bond nitrogen is the most stable molecule. We run all of our reactions under uh, an inert atmosphere of nitrogen gas, not oxygen, not uh, other gases, because N2 is so stable and unreactive. So when I see that, it just makes me think, man, that really wants to eject a nitrogen molecule. Let's go ahead and take a look at what's happening here. Uh, if, you, uh, if you treat an aniline molecule, benzene rings or aromatic rings with an NH2 with this uh, nitrous acid recipe. So what happens initially, I'm not going to review the mechanism, initially you're going to generate an N-nitroso compound, just like I showed you before in our last lecture. So you'll start off by generating an N-nitroso compound. I'm going to draw the bond of the H there. 
And this is stewing around under acidic conditions. You get this n nitroso aniline. And because there's an H on that nitrogen, it's not stable. It's going to continue to react under the conditions of the, of the reaction to make a diazonium group. So let me go ahead and draw the acid catalyzed mechanism for that. So you've got acid still floating around. I'm going to use this symbolic picture for an acid here. And then what's going to happen is we're going to protonate this. Now I could draw all kinds of ways to depict this protonation. I'm going to use the lone pairs here on oxygen to pick up a proton from our acidic species. What is that acidic species? Is it HCl? Is it water? These reactions run in water because that's where sodium nitrate is soluble. Um, well, who cares? We're just going to symbolize the acidic species for arrow pushing mechanisms as HA. And that will lead us to this, um, this next intermediate. Whoa, 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 I'm getting ahead of myself by drawing that. Don't draw that double bond yet. But you can see where I'm thinking here. I'm thinking, wow, we've got to get a triple bond in that uh, species. Okay, so we end up with this protonated species. And now, under the conditions of the reactions, we're ready um, to pull off a proton. So we're really doing a tautomerization mechanism right here. We're just showing how you add a proton to one place and remove a proton to the other. So I'm going to pull off the other proton from the nitrogen atom and push these electrons all the way over to this N that's doubly bonded to O+. Plus. And that's going to allow me to get rid of the positive charge on that oxygen atom. And so now, I'm getting very close. Now that's allowed me to generate a pi bond between these two nitrogens. And now all I have to do is turn that OH into a leaving group. And we're still under acidic conditions. We just regenerated HA. So let me go ahead and draw my, my acid molecule. Well, I can barely see that A right there. Let me try to do a slightly better job with that. And we're going to pick up a proton from our acid. And now that creates a, an amazing leaving group, water. Well, it's not as amazing as nitrogen gas, but it's, it's a leaving group, water. Oxygen does not like that positive charge. And now we're going to push out the water leaving group. We've got a, a lone pair on that nitrogen atom. Three bonds to nitrogen. It's neutral. You need to have a lone pair. So we'll just push out that water molecule right from the back side there. There we go. And that's what leads to this arene diazonium functional group, or aryl diazonium functional group. These aryl diazonium cations have useful reactivity. And I don't think it's going to be the reactivity that you expect. But let's go ahead and take a look at how we would synthetically make arene diazonium ions. You can store them as solutions. You can't dry them out. That um, They might explode on you because they want to generate nitrogen gas. But let's go ahead and walk through a synthetic sequence here where we can see how you could start with benzene right down here at the bottom. You could start with benzene and go all the way to an arene diazonium ion using reactions that you now know. So you've got to start off by putting a nitrogen carbon bond on your benzene ring. And you know how to do that. We showed you that on the first day of this quarter. We showed you how to make carbon nitrogen bonds to benzene rings. We showed you how to replace H's on benzene rings with, uh, uh, with, with um, nitrogen. Uh, with carbon nitrogen bonds. So step one, how are we going to make that carbon nitrogen bond? You already know that. That's nitration. Nitric acid, and we need a, a powerful acid catalyst in there, and I told you it was sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Boy, I'm running out of room here. And then, <clears throat> then once we put that nitro group on our benzene ring, once we put that nitro group, we don't really want a nitro group on our benzene ring. Let's go ahead and talk about reducing that down to an NH2. And the easiest conditions that you could use would be hydrogen and palladium on carbon. Right? The same conditions that reduce double bonds and triple bonds, carbon, carbon, double bonds, and triple bonds, will also reduce nitro groups down to NH2 groups. And that's now the starting material for this, uh, for this reaction to form diazonium ions. We call it diazotization,ization, diazotization. I'm not sure if the book uses that word anywhere in there. Uh, but if I talk about making an, a, a diazonium ion out of amine, uh, it, chemists in the lab call it diazotization. So what's our recipe for, uh, for doing this? Well, we can't buy nitrous acid, but we can make it easily in uh, a solution of nitrous acid in the lab. It takes sodium nitrite, 
you add it to an aqueous solution of hydrochloric acid. I'm not going to draw the water. You don't, it's not necessary for you to show that for the recipe. Um, and then you get out of this a salt. Now if, now, if I tell you, here's a box, draw the product, if you draw a cation, you have to draw the, the counter ion to that. I want you to draw neutral species, even if this neutral species is going to be a salt. So you, if I draw a box and say draw the product, you can't just draw the cation part. You have to draw the counter ion, which in this case is chloride, because you're floating around in HCl. Um, so that would be the product of the reaction. And now you can take your, your solution of arene diazonium and do stuff with it. And I'll show you all the amazing things that you can do with arene diazonium ions that make up for the deficiencies of our first chapter, chapter 16. I didn't show you how to make every bond to a benzene ring. Now I'm going to show you how to make the other types of bonds that we didn't talk about. Now I want to caution you because I told you already that for me, when I see this diazonium group, my gosh, I want... I want, uh, I want to make nitrogen gas. It's so stable, right? Our atmosphere is nitrogen gas because it doesn't react with anything. You form nitrogen gas, it gets stuck in the atmosphere and just sits there. Now, even though we want to make nitrogen gas, there's this frustrating situation here where it looks like you're ready to just pop out a nitrogen gas molecule, but that's never going to happen. It, we're never going to see either SN1 or SN2 reactions of these arene diazonium ions. And that's because, not because nitrogen gas isn't awesome and amazing. Nitrogen gas is awesome and amazing. The problem is you do not want to leave behind uh, the leftovers, which would be a phenyl cation. And I'm going to try to draw this benzene ring side on so we can appreciate what a miserable train wreck this would be of a carbocation. And the important thing is I didn't use any of the pi bonds in this benzene ring when I drew out this SN1 mechanism. I'm not saying this does SN1, but if it did, all of those pi bonds would still be there. And the carbocation would be sticking straight out from the side of this benzene ring, just straight sideways, with no interaction with the pi electrons. In other words, there's no resonance that can stabilize this kind of a phenyl cation. The carbocation sticking off to the side. All the pi electrons are sticking up and down. Let me try to use yellow here to, to draw out the pi electrons. They'd be on the top of the benzene ring, and then they'd also be on the bottom of the benzene ring. I wish I could shade that differently. But your empty carbocation would be sticking off to the side with zero stabilization. And in fact, that would be even less stable than, than a simple alkyl carbocation. So, so arene diazonium ion chemistry works because they can't do SN1 or SN2 when it's a benzene ring attached to the diazonium. Really frustrated situation. But that sets us up because arene diazonium ions want to react with something. Um, and let's go ahead and talk about some secret recipes that are really powerful and commonly used in organic synthesis and particularly in medicinal chemistry. Now, in the first chapter, I started off this course by saying I'm going to give you five recipes for substituting H's on benzene rings. Substituting H's with nitrogen, with chlorine, with bromine, uh, with carbon atoms. But I never told you, we never once talked about how you would put an oxygen atom on a benzene ring. And clearly, that is important. So how are you going to put an oxygen atom on a benzene ring if I never gave you a recipe? And this is where arene diazonium ions come into play. If you take arene diazonium ions and you heat them in water, and unfortunately the book does not show the heating part of this. You, you can't just store it at room temperature. But I'm going to allow you to write water with no heat, even though you, you'd have to heat this. You make these in water and they sit there in water. But when you heat these, something happens. And the something that happens is not SN1, it's not SN2. I'm not going to talk about what happens. I'm simply going to show you this recipe. And if you write that out, then that's conditions for converting arene diazonium chloride compounds, like this one right here, into phenols. That's powerful. Now you can acylate that to make an ester. Uh, you could deprotonate it and use, do SN2 reactions. They used to have a, a, a Chem 51 laboratory where they used phenoxide anions for SN2 reactions. So that's the only way that we're going to show you in this course to put carbon-oxygen bonds onto benzene rings. Okay, what's another type of atom you'd like to have on a benzene ring? Well, that would be a, a fluorine atom. Right? If you look at drugs, 
Medicinal chemists just seem to have this fetish for fluorine. It's like the, every methyl group on a benzene ring, they put fluorine. Every s drug you look at, they seem to have a fluorine on there somehow. And I never showed you how to put fluorine on a benzene ring. I showed you how to brominate, I showed you how to chlorinate, and that was it. If you want to put fluorine on a benzene ring, this is the only way we're going to show you for how to do that. That's to take an arene diazonium ion and treat it with a secret reagent, and that secret reagent is tetrafluoroboric acid, HBF4, tetrafluoroboric acid. It, tetrafluoroboric acid looks kind of mysterious, but if you took HF and you reacted it with a Lewis acid called boron trifluoride, the HF would poke its electrons into, this is, this is tetrafluoroboric acid is made by having HF add its fluorine electrons into boron. That's how you make, and it wants to give up the proton. Now I'm not going to show you the mechanism for how fluoride replaces the diazonium group, but you can see in all of these reactions you'll get a nitrogen gas molecule as a byproduct. You need to memorize that recipe, HBF4. Um, it might be written as H plus B of four minus, but actually the H is, is stuck to one of the fluorines uh, until it can transfer that proton. So tetrafluoroboric acid, that's the recipe for putting a fluorine atom on a benzene ring. And so now you know how to do, uh, you know how to do bromine bonds, you know, Br2 and FeBr3, you know how to do chlorine bonds, and now I've just shown you how to do the third halogen. There's a fourth halogen that we haven't shown you how to put on benzene rings, and that's iodine. And the way you make those is also from diazonium ions, and that would be uh, the secret recipe reagent that you use for that is potassium iodide. And you just have to memorize that recipe. You treat it with, I'm not gonna show you the mechanism for how that works, um, but this will replace diazonium groups with, iod with iodide, and it's the only reaction we will show you for how to make aryl iodides is to react arene diazonium ions. So you now know how to put all four types of halogens onto benzene rings. Why would anybody want to put iodides on benzene rings? There's this whole field of chemistry that we did not teach you that involves catalytic palladium, catalytic nickel, uh, that works with aryl halides, and iodides are the most reactive with those. If I'm trying to do chemistry, I want an iodide on my benzene ring. Uh, we're not going to tell you any reactions that require iodide instead of bromide or chloride, so it's not as useful to you, but iodide is important uh, for synthetic organic chemists. The last functional group that we're going to show you how to put on benzene rings is a cyano group. We showed you how to acylate uh, benzene rings with carbonyl groups using friedel crafts acylation, but we didn't show you how to put a, a, a cyano group, C triple bond N, onto a benzene ring. There's no way you would know how to do that. We didn't show you how to synthesize cyano groups. And the way you do that is using uh, this copper promoted reaction. Uh, the old style name is a, called a Sandmeyer reaction. I'm not sure how they selected these recipes. Um, there's other recipes that they're not showing you. I'm glad they didn't show you multiple recipes. There's nothing worse than when the book gives you five different recipes for how to do something and they don't tell you which one is better. Um, but here, the only recipe that we'll show you is cuprous cyanide, copper attached to cyanide anion, cuprous cyanide. Um, and that replaces the N triple bond N with C triple bond N. And once you've got a nitrile group on a benzene ring, well, now you can use lithium aluminum hydride to reduce that to methyl amino groups. You could add Grignard reagents into there uh, to make a single bond and then work those up with water to make carbonyl groups. No reason to do that because you could do that with friedel crafts acylation. Uh, but really that reduction uh, with, with lithium aluminum hydride might be the use, most useful transformation you can do with an aryl cyano group. Okay, so Here's four new types of atoms that we can put on benzene rings as long as you're able to make one of these arene diazonium ions. Let's go ahead and talk about the last, the fifth transformation of arene diazonium ions. This fifth transformation I'm going to show you leaves the NN attached to the benzene ring. We're not gonna replace, this fifth recipe is not about replacing the diazonium, it's about adding to the diazonium. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this reaction. It turns out that this N triple bond N that we've got right here can react a little bit like an acylium ion. You can do electrophilic aromatic substitution by getting electron-rich aromatic rings, highly activated electron-rich aromatic rings, like what? Like phenols and anilines. Those are the most reactive. 
Remember, I ask you to, to memorize the order of activating groups and alkoxy, hydroxy groups and, and NH2 or NR2 groups are at the top of the list for making benzene rings really reactive. So if you take a highly activated aromatic uh, substrate, like this, this is called resorcinol, it's got two hydroxy groups on there. Wow, this thing is reactive in electrophilic aromatic substitution. And so that would definitely be able to, to add to this diazonium group. And so what's happening right here is that you're doing a, an electrophilic aromatic substitution, replacing one of the H's that is ortho or para to the oxygens. And you don't go between the two oxygens, you go ortho to one and para to the other. So you can see what's happening is we're replacing one of the H's with this azo linkage. And whenever you see this, this azo linkage right here, this aromatic rings uh, linked together, that's called an azo compound, and that's called an azo linkage. Um, this tends to make colored compounds. Red compounds, yellow compounds, orange compounds. If any of you are drinking some sort of, of a, a drink, a Gatorade or some sort of soft drink that is red, or eating Doritos that are a mixture of red and orange and yellow, they are all colored by compounds made through organic synthesis just like this. They're made in a factory by people who sat in a class like this and learned how to do electrophilic aromatic substitution using a azo dyes. And they have tried every single type of aromatic ring on here to come up with every single color in the rainbow. And that's what you're eating when you eat your food. It tastes more delicious when you know <laughs> the chemistry behind it, I think. <laughs> Let's go ahead and talk about mechanistically what's happening. It's it's electrophilic aromatic substitution. There's nothing special about this. And we're going to attack this nitrogen. The, the only thing that is, it's not special, but you're going, every single fiber in your body is going to be saying, I've got to attack that N plus. No, don't do that. We didn't do that with acylium ions. That's not what we do here. We attack the nitrogen at the end. We attack the nitrogen at the end and we give those electrons to the N plus in the pi bond. Don't attack the N plus, please. <laughs> the product will not have a positive charge on nitrogen anymore, but it's don't attack the N plus. Um, you attack that. That's going to be the hard thing for you to remember. I'm just going to abbreviate one of these phenyl, phenyl groups with a pH just to make it easier. And there's our azo linkage. And now it's attached to this irenium ion. So we have an irenium ion intermediate. You guys need to be really good with irenium ion intermediates at this point in the course, right? That shouldn't be any mystery to you what's going on with an irenium ion. And so that leaves a positive charge. And I told you before, draw the H on that carbon that you're substituting so you'll remember to take it off, right? The next step is now obvious because I drew the H there on the irenium ion. So obviously we want to regenerate aromaticity and so we have the, the counter ion for our diazonium. Is it is it chloride that's pulling off that H? Maybe. Well, these are occurring in water. Is it a water molecule that's pulling off the H? Maybe. We don't know. We just know that some species with a lone pair is, is deprotonating. And that allows us to regenerate aromaticity and push the electrons back down into the benzene ring. And so that generates this azo compound. Uh, I'm sure this, this resource in all azo compound has a name. Uh, the one of these that has just a single OH, I think it's called, uh, well, actually, that might be with a, I forget, there's one of these, it's called butter yellow. It was one of the first uh, azo dyes that was used to, uh, to color uh, widespread food stuff. All right, um, <clears throat> so in the next section of the book, they tell you about some cool synthetic dyes, azo compounds, azo dyes, and one of the first classes of medicinal drugs prepare, prepared using organic synthesis called prontosil. Uh, but that's archaic now. Nobody uses those anymore to treat diseases, so it's not really important to talk about drugs with azo linkage because of metabolism problems. Uh, we don't use azo drugs much anymore, or sulfa drugs. Uh, but, but in small quantities in synthetic dyes, um, no problem. They've been tested over and over. Okay, that is the end of the material for this course. Now, what we're going to do when we come back on Wednesday is we have one quiz left worth 1% of your grade. You've had nine quizzes, and I told you in that original syllabus that we're going to have one last quiz. And it's not really a quiz. It's just, a, um, it's just kind of an assignment thing. So let me go ahead and tell you what I'm going to tell you about on Wednesday, this little preview. And I don't think it'll take a whole lecture on Wednesday. But on Wednesday, when we come back, I'm going to tell you uh, um, 
uh, I'm going to have you help us by participating in testing a, a system for predicting arrow pushing mechanisms using machine learning. So I have a collaboration uh, with a guy over in computer science, and we've trained a system using about 12,000 curved arrow pushing steps. And so now that system can predict arrow pushing steps. But we need people to help us check and see whether it's doing a good job. So now that you know how to draw out um, these smile strings using that, uh, using that JME molecular editor, you can paste any set of reactants into here. And then when you do that, the system will say, OK, I think these are the most nucleophilic atoms, and I think these are the most electrophilic atoms. And then it finds every possible arrow pushing combination, and then ranks them. And so you'll see a ranking that looks like this. And what it does is it tries to guess here, based on what it's seen before, just like you, you know, what is the most likely thing to happen? Now, this is part, using cyanoborohydride is for a cyanoborohydride reduction. It's for reductive amination. But the system guesses that the most likely thing to happen is water deprotonating the aminium ion. That's actually happening in the system. It, no, it doesn't lead to reductive amination, but the protonation and deprotonation is absolutely reversible, and that's a pretty smart thing. The thing that leads to an alkylamine is this second guess. Um, that's the part of the mechanism that leads to the products we talked about. We didn't talk about it going backwards and deprotonating the imine. Um, and so this right here, in all of this gobbledygook here, is the smile string for this arrow pushing step. And I'm going to have you find whatever step here looks like it's the one that leads to product and copy and paste that into our quiz box. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll see, right? Here's a, the case where the system didn't predict the right mechanism leading to the amine, but what it predicted was actually really smart. <laughs> and so, uh, but I would have you uh, select the, the um, select the smile string, the, it's called a smirk string, uh, for, th for the reaction that leads to the desired product, and then paste that in, and that'll be the answer. And I don't know how many of those I'll have you do, five or, or something like that, uh, by Wednesday of next week. You don't have to, even have to do it by um, by Sunday night, because I know you're, you'll have your hands full. Okay, that's what I'll, I'll come back and talk about uh, talk about this system. You know, in the future, when you when you work through mechanisms for my class and other people's classes, you'll be using tools based on machine learning. Um, and you may think, oh my God, it's going to take over. No, <laughs> you guys are better than any machine, and that's going to be true for a long time. All right, um, that's it for our lecture material for uh, for the course. Uh, We'll have extra study hall hours this week. Please go to discussion sections. Please go to the study hall hours. Work as many problems as you can for our exam on exam three that's on Friday. Um, and unfortunately, our final exam got scheduled for Monday right after that. I don't have any control over when our final exam is scheduled. Um, and okay, I'll see you guys throughout the week and on Friday for sure.